Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Artist Talk with Leone Garcia. I'm John Mellicky. I'm the Senior Development Officer for The Ringling, and we want to welcome you today uh, with this conversation with Leone Garcia and our board member, Javi Suarez. It's now my pleasure to introduce oh, Elizabeth Dowd, yeah. the Curie Coleman Curator of Performance at The Ringling. Elizabeth, take it away. Good morning, everyone, and welcome from wherever you may be. I'm Elizabeth Dowd, and I'm the Curry Coleman Curator for Performance, and we are live in the William G. and Mary Shelby Foundation Courtyard at the Ringling Museum of Art. I'm here to speak with and celebrate two extraordinary individuals who are working with the museum in artistic and advisory capacities. And before we jump into our conversation today, entitled Embodied Improvisation, Dance, Jazz, and Architecture, I'd like to introduce each of them. Immediately to my right is Javi Suarez, who is an award-winning architect with extensive experience in a wide variety of design applications, such as cultural, institutional, educational, commercial, religious, and residential projects. Javi's passion resides in the arts, both as a fine artist himself and as a strong supporter of the community's art institutions. He currently serves on the board of directors at the John and Mabel Ringling Museum. He also has served on the Dolly Museum Regional Board and the Board of Art Center Sarasota. Javi's work has been published in numerous local and national publications, and most recently it has been exhibited in Think Fast Exhibition, which was displayed at Ball State University in Indiana, Kansas State University, and the School of Design Strategies at Parsons in New York City. Javi is also a graduate of Leadership Florida Class 27. He holds a master's in architecture from UCLA and his graduate thesis focuses on the fusion of jazz and architecture. Farther to my right is Leone Garcia. Leone is a dancer and choreographer based in Miami, Florida. He holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from New, New World School of the Arts. And as a performer, he has worked with body traffic, performing choreographic, choreographic works by Guy Wiseman and Ron Haver, Barack Marshall, Alexi Turan with Bisturi Physical Theater, and he's a founding member of Rosie Herrera Dance Theater. He's currently a dancer in Bridget Baker's Whole Project. He's worked with director Celia Rouson Hall in her latest short film entitled Swamp Lake and filmmaker Claudio Marcatulli on his film installation Black Blasting Pixels. As a solo performer, Leone has performed at Mana Contemporary International, Noise Music Conference, and the Bass Fisher International in Invitational, along with modular furniture designer Dion Ruby. Garcia's choreographic works have been commissioned by Miami Light Project, the Dranoff Piano Foundation, Thomas Armour Youth Ballet, and Toronto's Outreach Exchange Strategy. Leone is a two-time recipient of the Miami-Dade County Dance Miami Choreographers Program and is a current resident and artist at Miami Light Project and the Sixth Street Dance Studio. Leone presented a new site-specific piece entitled Plaza, which was commissioned by Pioneer Winter Collective. Now, Leone is an artist in residence here at the Ringling Museum for 2019-2020, and he's working on a piece that will that is in development that has appeared at the Wolfsonian Museum in Miami Beach as well. And we will be seeing future iterations of this work. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of our talk. Um, I, you know, in planning the, the residency time with Leone here at the museum, we really wanted him to be able to be in conversation with the community. And in addition to be able to meet members in the community, artists, experts, people that may be able to share with him what it's like to live in Sarasota and also inform his work while he's here. And we, because Leone's work is focusing on architecture through the lens of dance, we were, it was serendipitous that Javi Suarez, who is an expert in architecture and also a lover of arts, was, um, is our board member. And so that's how this conversation came together. And um, let's get right into it. Um, I want to um, just ask you, Leone, to share a little bit about your background and tell us why architecture, why Art Deco? Okay, well, 
Um, I'm Cuban born and uh, I grew up in Miami. I've been working in Miami for several years now and uh, in performance and dance. Um, and that's kind of where, where, where my interests lie in dance and performance in particular. And this project, um, you know, my interest in Art Deco at first was just having that experience with the architecture in Miami Beach. Um, and at first, for me, it was uh, kind of just a, an intuition, uh, a kind of inspiration that came from it. And so as I start to research and start to uh, work with others and, and institutions like the Wolfsonian, I'm, I'm learning much more about the period. And so what's interesting to me about that period is that it comes out of uh, the First World War. So it's a time of hardship. And so it's the celebration of life, pretty much. It's a celebration of freedom and there's liberation in the air. And uh, I think the architecture or the architecture in, in particular just celebrates that. And it looks to past cultures. Um, it's different from modernism, which is just looking at the time. It, it references these past cultures, uh, past civilizations, and it's seeing it through the lens of modernism. Um, what that means is that it abstracts uh, like symbolism and uh, it refers to the past but is creating something completely new um, and that is very exciting the period in, in general is just as, a, as it starts as I start to research it more and more it's just fascinating there's so much uh, I guess the world we live in today was created then um, so modernism is is just a, a, a big change for humanity and uh, Art Deco promoted that, you know, it promoted a new way of life. And I didn't know any of this and getting into it, I just was interested in, it. I was called to the architecture and in uh, South Beach in particular, which is, you know, my first interaction with Art Deco. Um, it's very futuristic, you know, and that is something that Art Deco also plays with. It's these, it's futurism, it's cubism, and uh, some of these buildings to me resemble machines. Some of them resemble jukeboxes. It's made for entertainment. And so it all rises, uh, you know, it comes, uh, it's built within like a 10 year period. So you have a very cohesive, very harmonious uh, urban neighborhood. And so it's almost like going to an exhibition, you know, you're seeing uh, these different expressions of architecture. Um, and so it's very playful on that end. Um, and for me, the kind of the, the sensation I get when I'm there, it's one of liberation and optimism. Mm. And that is, I think, the one thing that really draws me to it. Um, and also envisioning, uh, you know, because Miami is attending this moment, like it could be underwater 100 years from now, 50 years from now. And so this, this piece uh, takes, takes it into consideration. And um, it's, my, it's, it, it's kind of my way as an artist to document, to document and preserve something that could be gone. Um, and so, you know, it's, it could be a lost city at some point. And so what this piece does is, uh, it, at least that's, that's my interest in, in creating a document, a, a performative document that preserves uh, this architecture, which I have an affinity to. Um, and it's also my hometown. So there's a, there's a connection there. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah. And I guess Art Deco in general, it, it, what it does is that all those references, it's such a, it's such a rich visual language that I could take from. And um, that's what I've used uh, so far uh, to create movement. And the fact that it's geometric is something that I can relate to as a dancer. As a dancer, we play with geometries all the time. And so there are parallels between architecture, design, and our bodies. And so that's, mm -hmm. kind, of, uh, that's kind of an entry point into 
creating a language that uh, that resembles it, and also, um, yeah, just creating a, a, a piece for the stage that is representative of the movement. Um, Great. I, there's, um, I love. I mean, I think that in the oftentimes we're um, thinking about things in categories of discipline so often. So how is it possible that a, the dance and architecture go together? Um, so maybe I would ask you the same question, um, Javi. What, uh, tell us about your background and why jazz? What, like, how is that possible that you would make a, a connection between architecture and jazz? So I was born actually in, in Puerto Rico and, and moved to the US, the mainland, uh, when I was 10. And, um, you know, music, is a big part of our culture. So I've always been surrounded by, by music. Um, and uh, I remember my first um, experience with jazz, my father brought home a, a Chuck Magnoni um, uh, album and uh, I kind of fell in love with the, with the music. Didn't really get into it too deep until I got into college and uh, I started listening to Winston Marsalis and the whole Marsalis family. And uh, that just blew open the doors. I was in undergraduate school. Uh, and then I started getting into bebop and hard bop and Charlie Parker and Coltrane and Miles Davis and all those guys. And um, as a fine artist, I was also trying to figure out how to produce some of the things that I was trying to study in architecture that I couldn't really do because architecture, it's a long process, especially, you know, once you really get into it and you're in the business of building buildings, uh, you can have a, a design that does not get realized for five, 10 years. And so, uh, I was looking for something more immediate. So in, in my art form, I was able to try to explore some of the ideas that I was having. And it just so happened that I started realizing that ideas of improvisation that came from jazz were appearing in my, in my artwork and then began to appear in, in the architecture that I was trying to develop. So that's really sort of how I got into it. Then. Uh, in, in graduate school, when I decided to really focus on it, um, I literally had to go over to the ethnomusicology department and ask permission to take classes because this idea of taking different classes from different departments really was not something that, that uh, was approved you know it's a, you're in a department you know we're giving preference to the students in our department to take our classes so forth and so on so i, I had to beg of all people kenny burrell who's a fa world famous jazz guitarist and, and played with with coltrane and and um I, I guess he saw the passion i had for it and uh he let me sit in uh in some of the classes that he taught he talked taught a course on Duke Ellington, taught a course on jazz improvisation and um, jazz theory. And so what I was really looking to do was scratch beyond the surface. So music and architecture have been around together for a long, long time. Um, the Greeks have looked at uh, music and architecture, mathematics, um, math and, and music and um, what's considered beauty or not based on proportions and, and things of that nature and, and scales and uh, things that uh, like that, uh, Western scales are kind of based on that same idea of, of those um, intervals. And um, when Jazz evolved, which really is really the first truly American art form. It's the fusion of uh, a lot of the uh, Western culture and then the African culture that was 
you know, in, 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 in New Orleans, um, you started to get this new form of music, which took classic standards, but the most important part as an artist was to put your stamp on it. So you were supposed to be able to play a piece of a classic piece, but when you played it, it had to be your sound. So you take a song like, for example, Caravan, which was uh, it's a standard, jazz standard. And funny enough, it was um, uh, actually written by a Puerto Rican uh, and uh, he played in the Duke Ellington band. So if you listen to what, the way they play that song Caravan versus the way that Thelonious Monk plays Caravan, it's almost like two different songs. What you hear through is the melody, but I mean, it's, you're, you're meant to play it differently. And so when I was trying to develop a language for architecture, I, I was brought up um, with the dogma of form follows function. A lot of the modernist background, the Bauhaus movement and all those things. And um, there were a lot of things that I could not uh, verbally express in, in my presentations in terms of my architecture. And that, and that always became a challenge because, you know, if I couldn't verbalize what the party was or what what the what was the the, the thought behind the, the the idea, then there was something potentially maybe wrong with it that that, that it wasn't right. But yet to me it felt right. So. Um, I had to figure out ways to find other parallels in, uh, in other art forms that were um, mindful of that, uh, the fact that you, know, you, can, you can have both. You can have the rational and the irrational. You can have the, the, the functional, the pragmatic, and, and then the, the emotional, the beauty at the same time, so. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting what you're saying about the, because I thinking about things that are improvised or the those qualities that perhaps are unidentifiable verbally um, or don't follow a, a kind of structure and logic. The, for me, it's like that, well, that may be related to a sense of instability. And that doesn't bode well for architecture, right? right? Like, so that, that's a really interesting <laughs> challenge for <Yeah>. you. <laughs> so so I, I think, um, you know, in terms of the, the practice of architecture, so, so there's, there's a couple of things I've been researching. I've been researching, uh, you know, how architecture is taught and the discourse behind how you teach mm -hmm. uh, architecture. Then you also have how you, the design process itself, which is a, a, another process, uh, which, you know, there's a lot of aspects of improvisation within that process of design, and you have to meld it with obviously the structure, which there's things that are fixed that have to, to be there because uh, you, you have to hold up the building. So, um, but, um, and then there's the actual method in which you communicate that design. So, you have buildings and, and, and architects like uh, Michael Rotundi, um, who was one of the original founding me members of Morphosis, that they started doing a lot of what's called design build. So they would um, really kind of lay out the framework and then they were there every day during the construction process to say, no, let's do it this way, let's do it that way it's not as, as formal as, for example, a commercial project where everything has to be identified in an architectural set, a set of drawings. So um, there's different points um, within those um, phases of architecture that 
the notion of improvisation could happen. Um, and to me, this was something that was always, um, I guess a misnomer to a lot of people, even myself, until I really got in, into talking with musicians that play it, improvisa uh, improvisation and jazz are not something that are just completely whimsical. They're, they're not just making stuff up as they go along. It's based on something. So, uh, for example, the beginnings of it, um, the improvisation have it happened over chord progressions. So as, as a song would evolve, there'd be certain chord changes and you'd improvise based on those chord changes. And then you, uh, that music theory evolved and you started getting into um, ideas of um, modality and improvisation and modality. And then you got into formulaic and pattern phrasing and all kinds of stuff, which I find that aspect of it really interesting. And that's some, some of the concepts that I can take and apply in architecture rather than this, um, this notion that it's completely free form, that, that there's, there's no parameters that guide it. Um, um, this idea of design build is I think similar to this, you know, an artistic process and movement, which is about practice as research. Rehearsal is research. Rehearsal is the making, it is the building. And um, can you talk, um, Leone, because you're building a dance right now. Yes. Um, <laughs> could you talk about your process and uh, in the corporeal decorum, which is the title of your new work? Um, how are you creating that choreographic language in response to architecture. So there's, I think the piece about how do you build as a dancer yes. and then how are you building in conversation with architecture as an inspiration? Okay, so um, for me, I think when, when, when I first encounter a building, the, what I'm drawn to specifically is the ornamentation or the decoration, which is the, sim, the symbolism. Um, and in Art Deco, that's, that's something that is really, um, that they use often. And so um, that was the first concept that I started to play with, how to translate uh, the decorative elements into movement. And that's what I've explored so far. Um, how I go about that, one is just choosing, I, you know, I go off of inspiration and, and intuition in a sense. So it's, it's choosing, um, you know, first take uh, walking around, walking around and getting to know the area, which is something that, you know, is, is, is another reason why I, I've chosen to do this project is just to be uh, in that neighborhood more often. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, in, in, in exploring, finding what calls me uh, um, in, in, the, in the decoration and then from there just taking a, you know, taking a photograph and then taking it into the studio and seeing how I can translate it into movement. Um, and so that process was uh, kind of very easy to me because easy in the sense that I'm, I'm used to taking inspiration from visual sources and then applying them to my body, you know, I'm, I'm imagining geometries all the time. And so this is taking it from, uh, you know, a, a built environment and then placing it in space. Um, so there's these lines that transect my body and this is something that you imagine, but ultimately come true. And so when I look at an image, I look for the design, um, the outline, um, and with, with Art Deco, it all is, even though it's referencing, let's say, a leaf motif, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's abstracted. So it's made into a kind of geometry. And that, that, is, that is what kind of called me to it. And in making it, I just, I either see it in the space or I draw it out with my hands or my elbow or my knee. And so 
with that, I start to kind of experiment as to how it can be translated. And even going a little bit further, I start looking at the rhythm, the rhythm of the, of the image um, or what it means. So um, as a performer, I'm also considering where, where, in what space is this? Is this out in nature? Is this a machine? How do I approach it? And so it, it, it sparks my imagination in many ways. And what I've done so far is to try to, to, try to get um, these different themes that are uh, particular to Art Deco, like man and machine and abstracted mm -hmm. nature. Um, also there's like, uh, there's the floral patterns. So I've taken, uh, there's sections that are all contrasting, right? And so what I've done is created movement segments per image. And that was, uh, that was the, the beginning of this process, right? Just how to create a still image into movement, um, which I presented as a, as a work in process. And so I have that I have that information or those that 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 foundation to then build a dance off of. So this was just research, and the next step in that process was to um, to choreograph to to actually put it to music. And so I chose a piece by Arnold Schoenberg from 1910. So it's before the Deco period, but you know I think that these composers are really looking. They're they're um, they're ahead of their time. And with this piece of music, I wanted it to, to, to give a sense of what Miami feels like to me. And it's a feeling of, it has a lightness to it and uh, um, a lot of flourishment and it flutes, flutes are it's something that I, I, I want to work with in this piece. Um, and in, you know, looking through several different pieces of music, this is what the one that, that, that was, best fitting for it. And then the next process was how to, how to um, use this foundation, use these themes to then choreograph to that piece of music. And some segments are in whole, are placed in the piece, and they just so magically worked with the, the, the tempo and the, the meter of the piece. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, some of it is, is just used as a reference. And so as I'm listening to the music and, and, and choreographing, um, that's kind of like my cheat sheet, you know, this, these references. And then when I'm there, I, I, it's kind of, the act of making is also very similar to improvisation. I have to go with what, what, the, uh, what the inspiration is at the moment. And I'm usually never wrong on that end. You know, as creators, <laughs> I feel like you kind of have to push that. Um, and then obviously there's the editing process, but that's been my process thus far where I want to take it. So now that I've explored this concept of how to, this is something that it's going to be ongoing in the creation of this work, how to translate, um, not only the ornamentation, but the masses of the buildings. Like how do I translate that with bodies on the stage? Now that we're working with a set, which is what we're doing here at the Ringling, um, is there a need for that? But, you know, we have to, we, right now it's just fleshing out a bunch of different ideas as to how it can be translated. And um, the next step for me is to take this, chore this very formal choreographed um, section and uh, deconstruct it. So this is a whole construction, deconstruction, very similar to architecture. The set is also, uh, it's going to be modular and the pieces are going to be able to be worn. So with this concept of corporal decorum, it's decorating the body. So um, in a way, how, how I feel or how I'm kind of um, considering uh, how to preserve, let's say, this architecture is through embodiment right so if i understand what those what that design is internally then it's forever in me and so i it's a and it's something that i can create in space even though it may be just imaginary um it, it's 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 present there um and so yeah and the next the next phase would be to deconstruct that formal language which um we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it involves improvisation. 
um, and and uh, just a breaking down, make, creating a much more nuanced language. We were talking about um, you know imp how improvisation kind of brings in the more the things that are un undif undefined or, or you know that you can't really put your mm -hmm. finger on or right. say what it is right. and uh, with movement language, it's been my experience that you can go into micro movements and create something that's a that's much more nuanced or more idiosyncratic than, let's say, a, a more formal dance. Um, and that is something that's interesting to me. Creating something formal, then deconstructing it, and seeing how how to play around with that. And that's been my process so far. And now we're working on. Um, the scenery and projections mm -hmm. and lighting. And so that's what we're experimenting with now here at the Ringling. And um, yeah. Well, that's really interesting about the, you know, the wearing of the pieces as part of the choreography and, and, and how that relates to space and architecture. Because uh, you think of architects like Frank Lloyd Wright mm -hmm. that would literally design the clothes that their clients would have to wear to be in to their be building, in the building. <laughs> which, which is really kind of nuts. I mean, he would design the silverware, he would design every aspect of, of living um, because he felt that, you know, beyond the piece of architecture was the space itself and how you embodied, you know, yourself within that space. So that aspect of it that you're talking about and some of the things that you were showing me mm -hmm. earlier, really interested to see how you develop that further. Well, uh, for me, it's, it's taking that, that built environment and the deconstruction for me is also abstracting it in a sense, you know, where uh, the, the stage then becomes this, uh, I foresee it like finding, um, like we're like archeologists who find ruins of Miami years from now. Um, and putting that back together. And so that is one aspect. And with True's work, which resembles to me, in, um, it resembles water. It's playing around, it's playing with this, this idea of, you know, a lost city very similar to Atlantis, you know? Um, and it, it, what's interesting is that when you're working with, with, with a set, um, I just don't want it to be a decoration. It's something that we will, we will interact with. And, uh, and I'm very excited about that process. I feel like that's what the choreography is going to be, even though I've explored translating it into movement a more, in a more formal sense. Um, I think it's going to go in that route of just constructing and deconstructing. There's also elements that you've built that you wear in costume, which I, I it's one of the, the striking things to me about the the first iteration of the dance. I really love those costumes. The costumes, yeah. Um, I think folks will be able to see examples of that in your lectem that we're going to do next Thursday. I want to. Um, could you give us an example of improvisation and in, in architecture? Okay, so you know, there's there's a couple things actually in talking about um, sort of the, the the density that you were talking about the the, the rhythm and, and the and the time structure and and, and finding um, a moment that's sort of the the counterpoint to it. Um, certain artists um, like uh, Coltrane might call it the blue note which is this, it just sounds weird. You, you, Coltrane would make these sounds with his, the saxophone where it almost sounds like he doesn't know what he, how, 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 to, how to play, but it's this, this note that he's trying to hit between half notes. I mean, it's mm -hmm. this, this, and so, you know, in, in architecture, you know, if, if you have this rhythm that you've set up, uh, whether it's the structural or whether it's uh, the, the the language of the elevation, and you find a place to break it, and you, and you're putting it because it feels right because you, you you need to break that that rhythm, 
I mean, that's one, one aspect of improvisation. Uh, another aspect of improvisation is really, to me, are um, thinking about how you, as we were talking about uh, the, the design build, um, and also the, the way you were talking about your exploration in 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 your, you know, uh, kind of putting it together and taking it apart, putting putting it together, taking it apart. Mm -hmm. What you end up performing. Is really a frozen moment, and and so uh, the same with with jazz. Really, a, a lot of the you, you get a lot of albums with that are that have different takes. You take take one, an alternate take, and this and that and the other, and it's really because each one of those things is just a capture capture of that moment. And so, with with architecture, the same the same thing. I mean, um, the design process itself. Uh, you could take it to a point where you're trying to um, capture the essence of what you're trying to say um, from a design standpoint and then be able to present that as sort of the literally the frozen moment because I mean it's yeah. going to be built and it's going to be finished um, but there's there's architects that have explored you know ideas of modules where you could take a module and uh, you know whether that's be the the living space or the things that not don't necessarily have the fixed items um, that require grounding like plumbing um, structure and you would shift those in between and so you could take those different modules and you can rearrange them in places where you have the fixed stuff that you need to for structural purposes and for um, other types of uh, requirements and you can shift those. Um, now we're seeing that there's there's you know advancements in technology where you know you have uh, water systems that are tubes or plastic uh, rather than copper and, and PVC. So that gives you some, some more flexibility. Um, you're getting some flexibility in forms uh, with some of the new materials that are going out. We were talking about um, GFRC, which is uh, glass fiber reinforced concrete. And it, it, um, it does, it's woven with with glass fiber, the concrete itself, and it, it requires uh, less water, and um, it allows for more, more formal expression. And so you're seeing it appear in uh, some of the new architecture, for example, that Zaha Hadid is, is doing. And um, uh, one thing that I'm interested in is, is in the actual fabric forming process of it where you literally take fabric and that becomes a formwork rather than a traditional rigid formwork. You stretch a canvas and you, or we used to use uh, what we called uh, old man pants, <laughs> which were the, 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 the corduroy and wow. the, the, they had the right elasticity and, 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 and stiffness to them where they would, you know, you get them to a certain tautness and they would hold the shape with the weight of the uh, GFRC poured on them. And so you could do um, a pour and set up um, places where you wanted that form to do its thing and places where you wanted to contain it and frame it. And as you pour it, you would kind of let it, let gravity do its thing. And, and, and so some of the formal shapes that come out of it really are part of the process, part of the improvisation. So when you, when, when the piece is finished, then again, it's a piece, it's a frozen moment. It's a, it's a, a, a product of that process of making, which is really interesting to me. So I was thinking a little bit about, I would love to see that 
I saw my he was showing his pictures earlier. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, there's well, there I want I did want to mention um the the true that you mentioned is your collaborator that's yes. here with you, right? Yes, okay. True um who's working with the video and the installation video elements. projections and acrylic uh sculptures. Yes. Great. <laughs> and um and so you said something, Leone, about this idea of nature and the machine mm -hmm. together. And um Talk about that a little bit. Like, what for you? I mean, this, this question or an observation that for both of you. So, nature and machine. Like, how is that? Yeah. How is that? How, what does that mean in Art Deco and and then well, Tropical Deco? Yeah. Celebrates that, you know. So, up in the north, you have um, representations or, or imagery that relates to man uh, overtaking nature through machine. And then in the tropics, you have the celebration of nature, period. So there isn't really much, um, uh, aside from the, I guess, the building processes and the forms of the buildings, what, what's, what's, what's celebrated on the decoration would be what's, what's regional. And so it's a regional expression of uh, architecture. And... For me, the buildings, the more and more I look at it, because I think it, you know, it's relating to the Bauhaus, which is, um, you know, it's, indus it's pretty much industrial design. And the more and more you look at some of the, um, some of what is made, let's say the, the railing or um, some of the components are, even the structures of the building themselves, some of them look like machines. You know, and I think that that's what they're also promoting. They're promoting yeah. this modern age, yeah. and so yeah, the the, the facades oh, themselves yeah. are an advertisement for modernism, which is there's a in that period they're converting people. It's like if I consider drones, everybody was really afraid of drones, and at the time, I mean, I was at least, <laughs> and at that time, I could see why how people were maybe afraid of of uh, of of the machine dehumanizing the uh, our experience here and and so that it took a while for me to understand that that was a process for people to um to to want to embrace modernism and the machine age um now i mean now it's fully embraced and so we don't even consider it but then the the Promotion had to be done. There was, uh, you had, it's, it seemed to me like that was a, that was a whole process. And in, yeah, and the deco structures to me, I guess, because that's what they're referring to, they end up looking like um, mach machines. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the, during that style, that, that whole Bauhaus period, it's really interesting because that Art Deco, especially the tropical deco, um, as you were saying, a lot of the decoration, a little bit more floral, whereas you get some of the uh, other types of um, deco and then uh, that moves uh, maybe a little bit more towards the brutalist side and, or, or the socialist side where, you know, you, you're, you're actually seeing literal the the um, decorative language becomes these expressions of man and the machine and, mm -hmm. and, and you, you can um, um, think of uh, the, the paintings by Diego Rivera and, 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 and things like that, um, where I think the, the, the tropical deco, it's really interesting because, you know, the Bauhaus really was born out of the Art Nouveau movement and, and, oh. and, 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 and so the, the Art Nouveau movement um, is the beginning of the Bauhaus. And there, it was really um, that there was a school that preceded it that really was about the fusion of all the um, um, industrial it, design. Well, it, art, uh, music, mm -hmm. uh, all, all the different. Um, uh, art, arts in general, and um, 
you, you had um, people like Johan, uh, his last name is Eaton, I believe it is, uh, Eaton, Johan Eaton, who was one of the sort of the early members before Walter Gropius got in there and, and Corbu mm -hmm. that took it completely towards the machine aesthetic, mm -hmm. which is what you know, it's really known for. But before that, like uh, Eaton was more, um, a lot of people see him as this, this weird, I guess what you would consider maybe now a, a hippie or <laughs> some sort of mystic, you know, he, he, his way of teaching was, was about feeling and, you know, he would do these exercises about, you know, taking materials like wood and metal and, and figure out, you know, how they come together and how to create something out of wood and metal, but it was beyond the practical aspects of it. It was also sort of like the, the, the natural aspects of the materials. And so, you you know, you have that, I think that it, uh, the that Art Nouveau maybe, I mean, the, the art deco, the tropical stuff, kind of fell in a period where still it was in, in, in transition, transition, maybe, yeah. maybe um, uh, because you're, you're, you know, you're quite right. I mean, you, you go down to Miami and, and South Beach and, and you see a lot of these more organic patterns and mm. within the, the, the skeleton yeah. of the, the machine aesthetic. And even yeah, and I remember being exposed to the, to those aesthetics of the more industrial, deco. It, it, the, the holdings of the Wilsonian, yes. of course, are yeah. great examples of that. Very sleek and, yeah. you know, gla you know, just smooth, um, uncompromising, mm -hmm. well, um, chicness. What's amazing to me is that it's it's made by a machine. So it's you know you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Like these designs are it, it, there's a whole process that uh, the process then is uh is what creates the form mm -hmm. um so it creates yeah the, the aesthetic of it is is completely machine made you know and it's funny we're just coming in here this morning of course in the courtyard we were noticing how you know you close your eyes and then a vine grows in florida yeah. so it's it's appropriate <laughs> to florida that even you know the the industrialization of this, the peninsula mm -hmm. has happened and there's structure here, but the vegetation, the, the flora and the fauna is so mm -hmm. strong mm -hmm. that it just keeps, it it's just a constant, it. <laughs> you know, interaction. And it happens in, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it happens in, in, the, in the Caribbean as well, because oh, in yeah. the Bauhaus, you know, they, that movement was brought in, modernism was brought in, in into Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba, but you, the buildings that you see are a little different because the li the way that you live there is a little bit different. The relationship to nature is a little bit different, so that the it begins to have uh, a sort of a language, a, it's a derivative of or a language of based on that modernism, but it's really a, a tropical modernism or whatever, you know you want to call it. I don't, I don't know if there's a, a coinage or, or a title for that, but. Well, yeah. And, and I think there's probably a lot of examples of that throughout Latin America mm -hmm. that are, you know, mm -hmm. re, that are responding in that same way, architecturally in design. I know Brazil, Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, we're getting close to the end of our time and I want to open up to our viewers our, 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 that are with us on Zoom. And I think Sharon has a few Oh, there's an, oh, we don't have um, any questions. If there's anybody that wants to ask a question, we can have a, a chat. Um, but if not, we can, um, I do want to talk a little bit about geometry because you mentioned geometry. Um, can you just talk about how yeah. so like the prior, geometrics? Uh, the project I did prior to this, it wasn't really a project. It was more of study that I did with a couple of dancer friends of mine. And so we had this time and um, we had a residency at Incubate in Miami. And um, I was trying to find a kind of, un I didn't know this at first, but throughout the process, that's what I figured out. I was trying to find some kind of unified language that we could all improvise off of. And so I reduced that to kind of the most minimal um, geometry, which we, we did a right angle. 
And so the dancers and I, for about two months, we just improvised based off of this geometry. So how can that geometry be manipulated, varied, placed in the space? How could it transfer over to, you know, from your arms to your legs? And we did this, this was our process. We were just improvising. So everybody, it wasn't our, it wasn't free form. It had, it had a specific um, shape that we were working with, but the variations that came about that per person and also as a group um, was infinite for the most part. Wow. You know, it was infinite and that is, you know, that was that process, which was reduced to just that geometry, but that can also um, exponentially grow as, as more geometries are added to that. Um, and so in that process, which is something that you brought up, which is very interesting through improvisation, how we ended up creating, let's say a work was capturing it. So I called it recording. So as, as the dancers and I uh, got comfortable with, with each other and we are, it was a conversation that we were having, you know, on timing, but the, it, it's interesting how visually, if you're just working with a right angle, how all those relationships interact and nothing seems arbitrary or out of, out of, um, out of that language. And in that process, after getting really comfortable, uh, we had a presentation and so we had to present something and it was kind of like this moment of capturing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, capturing a moment in time. Mm -hmm. And that was new to me because I'd always, choreography for me was always pre-planned. Um, and this was recording improvisation, but we were so accustomed to it that the memory, you know, when you improvise, it's really hard to memorize. But once you're already in the process of doing that and you're, it's, it's reduced to a very simple um, vocabulary, then you, yeah, you can remember it. And so what we, were, what we would do is improvise and record that, that section. Improvise and record, it was pretty much choreographing. And um, that experience was, with something that I'm keeping, you know, I'm keeping because with this process also, I want to go in that direction, but add complicated a bit more to see what happens. So it's an experimentation um, on adding uh, several different geometries, I would say, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, seeing what comes of it. And yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, in architecture, obviously, yeah, it's big part of our vocabulary and um, I think to me what I, uh, I find interesting is a combination of um, traditional um, you know uh, language of squares and triangles and circles and then combined with the free form or the organic and so sort of where they they intersect that, that in between you, you get that. So a lot of the work I do as a fine artist is about overlays. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so it's one image overlaid over another image, overlaid, overlaid over another image. And I render the, the in between, so literally where they overlap. And so uh, I started to take some of that ideas into, uh, you know, some thoughts about architecture. So I'll start sketching out an idea for, for a form and it'll be the rational, it'll be the, the square, it'll be the triangle, it'll be the circle, and then it'll be the emotional, which will be the free form, kind of, you know, my gut feeling about the place, the location, you know, the air, the weather, um, uh, the people, whatever, the, the program, what the client, what, what yeah. you know, what they're like, and then kind of see how those geometry start to overlay on top of each other and then what I'm really interested in is is that new form that comes out of it so it's that new shape that came from sort of both sides from as you were saying from the right angle that that you you sort of fix but then you you, you, know, you twist it and change it and then you become something else out of that 
you know, parameters that you've set. And, and to me, that, that, that's uh, what, what I find uh, attractive about the process and want to explore further as well as I move into some of my stuff. Oh, I think we have some questions from our audience on Zoom. Um, take it away, Sharon. Thank you. Um, question one, how do Leone and Javi see the tension between the fluidity of dance and the static form of the building? Um, is the reshapable building like the Milwaukee Art Museum a partial answer or a dead end? From the Milwaukee Art Museum. Could you repeat that? I wanted to catch the last part of it. The 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 Milwaukee. The art last Museum? part of the question is the reshapable building, like the Milwaukee Art Museum, yeah. a partial answer or a dead end. So I, I could speak to the the second part of the the answer. That's that's actually I believe it's a Calatrava building that open and closes. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there's certain aspects of that that deal with the Calatrava is trained as a engineer and, and as an architect. And he draws a lot of uh, his inspiration from, from nature. And so he draws a lot of uh, bones and birds and, and things of that nature. And it's very skeletal. And so um, there's a lot of fluidity in, in, his, in his work. Um, I think that the aspect of or the notion of movement gives it even another uh, level to it. Um, and um, I, def I, I think that's a, you know, a good example of the, the combination of, of the two. Um, there's there's other, um, uh, there's a landscape architect by the name of Walter Hood, who I've been looking at uh, for a long time. He's out of the Bay Area and his work is amazing. He was the um, landscape architect for the, the Young Museum in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the landscape architecture that he did for that project, especially at the entry, you will see these seem like uh, boulders of that are for sitting that look like they're in random positions at the entrance. But if you really pay close attention, there's an interrelationship between the pieces. And there's actually fissures in the uh, ground that I don't know if they marked or, or how they did it that end up tying the pieces back together again. So you see in, at first blush, it looks like something very rigid, um, yet irregular because it's, it doesn't seem to have an order for how it's placed. But then if you really look at it, soak it in, and, and me knowing his, his work, looking for those clues, I could find out that, you know, this was, there's, there's, a, there's a thought process, there's a depth of, of thinking of how these things weave and, and talk to one another, which is one of the things that you were talking about, which is this, this, this conversation that you have with your, your fellow artists. Mm -hmm. And that's something that in, in music obviously is, especially in any kind of uh, music that is of African roots, this whole call and response uh, language that um, it's difficult to achieve in, in architecture, but I think that you, you definitely can because it, you, you can start to think and design how certain pieces of the building start talking to other portions of the building or spaces in the building have certain proportion or scale that relate to another portion of the building or um, so uh, I don't know if that answered a, a portion of that 
question, but uh, that was my view on it. Um, I think the if I'm thinking about architecture and I'm thinking about the built environment and the geometries that um, they're you know geometries that are constructed, so um, they're visible, they're made visible, they're made tangible. Um, and with dance, uh, we're working with those geometries constantly, except it's kind of in a it's it's imaginary in a sense, but it's something that you can sense. So when you have a group of people, it, the designs exist in nature, and they 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 they're forever present if you can detect them. So um, that's kind of one approach: is just sensitizing the body to 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 understand what a line feels like or what a curve is feels like, and that's something that you. First, you, 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 you see it uh, as kind of uh, the static, the static, um, you kind of mimic it, but then there's sensations that come with it and keeps, keeps refining um, those geometries within the space. And so uh, there's a fluidity to something that's, uh, meaning we can, by detecting them and laying them out, through, uh, you know, you can you can visualize a circle there, and I can walk in that circle, and it will feel to me as a perfect circle because it is. You know, I'm organic, the shape is organic, and so we can meet together. Um, and architecture, I feel like, does that. Um, it has to be perfect because otherwise it'll collapse, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, for the and so so the you know that's that's the. Interesting part because to me, architecture is more than just that portion of it, which is really about the structure. And, you know, we, 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 we work with structural engineers to make sure that the building doesn't fall. And, and um, there's a, a whole level of study that if you want to, you can make anything work it's a matter of, of, of how much you want to pay for it so you look at some of the um the work that hadid has done the gary has done and and they work with uh, you know certain st structural engineers that they can figure it out yeah, there's some dance artists that, <laughs> that go for that too so um i think we're gonna wrap it up um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I especially want to thank Leonie Garcia, Javi Suarez. Thank you so much for joining this conversation and sharing your work with us. I do want to mention that we have a lecture demonstration with Leonie happening this Thursday, December 10th. It will be um, available via Zoom. And that information is on our website, free for members. And it's open to the general public as well. And this is um, a a conversation with an artist in residence as part of our 1920 Art of Performance offerings, um, unable to have full live performances on the historic Oslo Theater stage, but looking forward to that, um, of course, with a premiere of Leone's work that will be um, in our season at some point in the future. And I can't thank you both enough again. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.